Hey everyone, it's Allison from the DNA Learning Center here with another DNA LC short. Have you heard about CRISPR but you're not quite sure what that means? Today in this short video I will introduce you to the technique of CRISPR and explain how scientists can use it to edit genomes. So first of all, what is CRISPR? CRISPR is an acronym that stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Usually when people say CRISPR though, they're talking about a CRISPR-Cas system not just those palindromic repeats. Cas9 stands for CRISPR-associated protein 9, so as the name implies, Cas9 is a protein, and more specifically an endonuclease, a type of enzyme that cleaves or cuts the backbone of DNA somewhere in the middle of a chain. Cas9's main job is to cut DNA, originally as part of a bacteria immune system, but scientists have adapted this system to edit genomes. There are multiple Cas proteins, but today I'm mostly going to focus on Cas9. Before we start talking about how scientists can edit genomes with Cas9, I think it's useful to understand a bit more about how Cas9 cuts specific sequences in DNA. So how does Cas9 target a specific DNA sequence? Target specificity in Cas9 is not determined by the protein itself. It's determined by an interaction between an RNA molecule and the target DNA. This RNA is referred to as a guide RNA, usually written gRNA, or sgRNA for single guide RNA. This single guide RNA is actually a combination of two RNA molecules, a transactivating CRISPR RNA, tracer RNA, and a CRISPR RNA, crRNA. In bacteria, these are transcribed as separate molecules, which then form a hybrid RNA that forms a complex with the Cas9 protein. This is my depiction of that complex here. In the lab, scientists usually synthesize the final hybrid RNA as a single RNA, skipping the step where the two RNA molecules have to come together to form a hybrid. So now we have a piece of RNA stuck to a protein. The crRNA part binds to its complementary sequence in the DNA. What this means is that there are 20 bases or so in the crRNA that determine where Cas9 will cut because those 20 bases will only base pair with their complementary sequence in DNA, not just anywhere. So crRNA guides Cas9 to that sequence, hence the name single guide RNA. There's another requirement, which is that there is a PAM sequence in the DNA just after the targeted region, but the PAM sequence is pretty general. For Cas9 from Streptococcus pyogenes, which is often used in labs, the PAM sequence is NGG, so any nucleotide N, followed by two Gs. Cas9 has two nuclease do domains. Once it's at the target DNA, if there's a PAM sequence present, it cuts both strands of the DNA, which leads to a double strand break. Double strand breaks are dangerous for cells because the ends of the DNA can be damaged or can fuse with other DNA. So a cell will quickly try to repair this break. There are two main ways a cell can repair a double strand break. One is called non-homologous end joining, NHEJ, and the other is homology-directed repair, HDR. These are both complicated processes, so for the sake of time, I'll simplify them like this. In NHEJ, the cell sticks the two ends of broken DNA back together. This is usually an imperfect process, so sometimes an extra nucleotide or a few extra nucleotides will get included, leading to an insertion or a nucleotide or several nucleotides will be removed, leading to a deletion. So this is a way that scientists can disrupt a gene by using NHEJ in the cell. In HDR, the cell uses a homologous, so identical or at least very close to identical, strand of DNA as a template to repair the break. Scientists can provide a template that either has a specific change, like a specific mutation they'd like to introduce, or a template that has an added bit of DNA, something like a tag they'd like to be included with a protein, which will be incorporated into the DNA. So that's the basic idea behind CRISPR. A protein RNA complex binds to a particular region of DNA, the DNA gets cut, and the cell tries to repair the cut. Scientists can take advantage of and manipulate those repair mechanisms to make changes in a genome. One of the really useful things about CRISPR for scientists is that it's pretty easy to change what DNA Cas9 is targeting. It's relatively easy to make RNA with different sequences, so scientists can make lots of guide RNAs that target different DNA sequences. 
then they just combine the RNA with Cas9 and target away. Well, it's not actually that simple. It's still hard to predict which gRNAs will work best to target Cas9 to the desired DNA without also guiding it to off-target regions of DNA. There are a lot of online tools to design guide RNAs, but even the best predictions don't always work out, so scientists have to test multiple options. Luckily, this is pretty easy. Like I said, scientists can make multiple gRNAs pretty easily, but it still requires a lot of work to test them all. Different types of cells and cells under different conditions use different repair mechanisms at different rates. So it can be tricky to get the mutation or change you want because the cells you're using might not repair their double strand break in the way you expect them to. To top it all off, it's not always easy to get the components of CRISPR into cells. It's not usually so hard in a dish in the lab, but when you start thinking about using CRISPR as therapy and needing to get proteins and RNA, maybe even template DNA, into cells inside of a body, that's pretty tricky. It's easier for some types of cells, like blood or bone marrow, that can be removed from a person, edited with CRISPR, and then returned to that person. But for tissues or organs that aren't as accessible, targeting is a real challenge. There are also a whole slew of ethical dilemmas and questions about editing DNA in people that I don't have time to talk about today. So all of the features I described today make CRISPR-Cas9 really useful for scientists who are working in labs. Most of the reasons that CRISPR is revolutionary are related to the impact this technique has had on basic biology. These are not necessarily the things you read about in flashy headlines, so sometimes it might not seem like CRISPR is living up to the hype but it's definitely making things easier for scientists in the lab. Compared to other methods of genome editing, CRISPR can be cheaper, faster, and easier. Scientists have also come up with all sorts of creative ways to use CRISPR to do different things. Mutated Cas9 proteins that can't cut DNA, often called dead Cas9 or DCAS9, can be fused to other proteins, which can then be targeted to specific DNA targets. There are also other Cas proteins that behave a little differently than Cas9 that can be used to detect the presence of a particular DNA sequence. So while you probably won't be doing CRISPR in your living room anytime soon, you might very well use it if you work in a biology lab, and it certainly makes things easier there. I hope you've enjoyed this quick introduction to CRISPR. Let us know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions for future DNALC short content. Be sure to check out our other videos and subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on social media so you don't miss anything.